When it comes to our muscles, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about what happens at the chemical level uh, whenever we do movements. But it turns out it's a somewhat complicated and I think fascinating process. We call it the sliding filament model because the filaments are pulling or sliding across each other. Of course, every time we move our muscles, it starts in the brain. The brain has to send a signal down to the muscles to get them to contract. We're gonna start with an action potential from the brain and work our way down to the sliding filament model where the actual proteins are pulling on each other to contract the muscle. Let's jump to the whiteboard and get started. All right, so before we get into the sliding filament steps themselves, we have to take a look at something called excitation contraction coupling, which is this idea that for a muscle to contract, we first need a signal or an excitation that's gonna come from the brain. The brain's gonna send a signal down through the spinal cord out through a nerve to whatever muscle it is that we're trying to move and then the muscle can contract as a response to that so in our diagram here we have those two cells we have a neuron and this is the axon terminal of a neuron we have a synapse the connection between this neuron and this muscle cell now because it's a neuron and a muscle cell sometimes we also call this a neuromuscular junction but it's just a synapse and that axon terminal of course has some vesicles with neurotransmitters there's some receptors on the postsynaptic cell which is our muscle fiber and our muscle fiber is going to have several organelles that we're going to label here this first one the transverse tubule that goes down into the muscle cell as well as the sarcoplasmic reticulum which is going to store calcium to be released as part of this process now i didn't draw all of the sarcoplasmic reticulum i sort of cut it off here so i have room to draw and write other things in the diagram and underneath the sarcoplasmic reticulum are the myofibrils which contain the myofilaments. So these are the myofilaments here, and we have two of those, of course, the actin and the myosin. And that's kind of our end goal, is to get them to pull on each other and shorten the length of the sarcomere, which is the space between this Z-line and this other Z-line. And as that happens, our muscles contract. So that's our end goal here. But it all starts with the brain sending action potentials through neurons, which is where we're gonna start right now. So first we have this action potential, it's come down the axon, now it's made it to the axon terminal. That's gonna cause the vesicles to release the neurotransmitters, which are gonna bind with the receptors on the postsynaptic side down here. That's gonna cause sodium to rush into the postsynaptic cell through a process called synaptic transmission. And if you need to, check out my videos on action potentials and on synapses, which I'll link to the description down below. Now, once this muscle cell depolarizes right here because of the sodium rushing in, that's gonna cause more sodium channels to keep opening down the length of the neuron, which causes that new action potential to travel down the sarcolemma, the cell membrane of the muscle. Eventually, that signal is gonna make it to a T tubule. Now, I just have one T or transverse tubule drawn in here, but there's really lots of them throughout the muscle cell, and they're all gonna be conducting the signal down into the muscle cell. So the signal travels down into the transverse tubule, down to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which, like I said, is gonna be filled with calcium ions that as soon as the signal gets there, these calcium ions are gonna get released out into the myofibrils. And that all started with the action potential that through this chain of events now has caused the sarcoplasmic reticulum to leak calcium ions into the myofibrils to interact with the myofilaments. And in the presence of calcium, the myofilaments will start grabbing onto each other and contracting. And then we get something like this. See how they're much closer together. The length of the actin and the length of the myosin didn't change, but as they pulled on each other, the length between the Z lines from there to there has decreased and now we have a contracted muscle. And as long as there's signals being sent from a neuron and therefore calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we're gonna have contracted muscles. So just a quick recap of all of that so far, it all starts with the brain, the motor cortex in the brain sending a signal down through the spinal cord, out through a nerve, and eventually that's gonna make it to the end of a neuron that connects to a muscle cell. So we start with an action potential that's gonna cause synaptic transmission in the neuromuscular junction. That signal is going to travel down along the sarcolemma, down into the transverse tubules, where it's going to interact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, causing it to release calcium ions. In the presence of calcium ions, the actin and myosin will contract like that. Relax, contract, relax, contract relax contract sorry we don't have a huge animation budget we just do two frame animations here okay now let's take a deeper dive into the sliding filament part of this which is where the filaments grab onto each other and how is that all regulated by calcium so let's zoom in to this section right in here all right so here we have our two filaments we have myosin in pink that's our thick filament and we have actin in purple here that's our thin filament if you look closely you'll see green dots you see green dots on the myosin heads as well as green dots on all these circles, which are the actin molecules. Those are binding sites. This is where the myosin head can latch onto or bind with 
the actin molecule. Throughout this video, I'm going to use the non-scientific term of grab, like the myosin head grabs onto the actin, but a better term to use really here is bind. It's going to chemically bind with the actin molecule whenever it pulls on it. But we have a problem. The binding sites are actually covered up by a molecule called tropomyosin. You'll see it here, I just drew it in brown, and notice how it's hard to find the green dots on there. You have to look really closely now. That's because this molecule that I drew in brown here, this tropomyosin, has roped off or blocked off the binding sites. And I think about that like it's roped off, like if you go somewhere and the seats are roped off, reserved for somebody else. Tropomyosin is roping off and has rope in there, right? Trope, ropomyosin. It's blocking the binding sites, meaning our muscle can't contract right now. We have one more little molecule on there, and I drew that in yellow, and that's called troponin. Troponin's kind of connected to the tropomyosin, and they're going to be interacting with each other in a second. So again, we have myosin, we have the myosin heads, we have the actin molecules in purple, the green binding sites, which is where the myosin heads can grab onto the actin. Those, of course, are blocked by the tropomyosin. That's that kind of brown looking rope right there. And we have troponin, which I have here in yellow, and we'll see what that does in a second. So at this stage, we're sort of in the off setting, right? The muscle's not contracted yet. We're about to contract the muscle, and I'm going to call that stage one here in just a moment. Okay, now let's assume that the sarcoplasmic reticulum has released calcium ions, right? We've had a neuron send an action potential from the brain down to this muscle cell. The sarcoplasmic reticulum releases its calcium, and here's what's going to happen. Some of that calcium is going to bind with the troponin. So these orange calcium ions are going to bond with the yellow troponin right there, and that's going to cause the tropomyosin to actually peel back out of the way. And if you look closely at our diagram now, you'll see there's still tropomyosin there, but notice how it's not blocking the binding sites. You can see those little green dots on there pretty clearly now because the tropomyosin has been pulled back. And that happened whenever the calcium ions binded with the troponin, which pulls back the tropomyosin, so the binding sites are exposed, and now the myosin heads are going to be able to form a connection to them. This is sort of the on state now. Our muscle's about to contract. But that's going to take a few stages for it to happen. Notice in our diagram now that the myosin heads are physically connected to the actin molecules. Their green binding sites are lined up with each other right there. And so this is latched on. We call this forming a cross bridge. I think of this as the grab stage. The myosin head grabs onto the actin. Really, it binds with it. And we say that the myosin head forms a cross bridge. A bridge connects two things together. And so we call this sort of a bridge, a cross bridge. But the myosin head has formed a cross bridge between the myosin molecule and the actin filament. Once we've formed a cross bridge, that myosin head now is going to pull. And we call the pull, this is the actual scientific name for it, we call the pull the power stroke. So turn on, grab, pull. I think these stages are a lot easier to remember if you think of them like that. Turn on, grab, pull. We'll see what happens next. All right, we've pulled now, and we need to reset so that we can pull again or just to relax the muscle if we're not going to contract it anymore. So this stage has two parts to it. One is to release, and the second is to reset. ATP is used in this process. So contracting our muscles is pretty ATP intensive. Our brain, along with our muscles, use more energy than any part of the body. And this is one reason why every time we have a grab and pull and release cycle here, we have to use up an ATP molecule. You need that energy from it for this to happen. So the ATP does two things. It's going to break the cross bridge, and then it uses up its energy to reset the myosin head back to where it was. I like to think of this like a mousetrap. The mousetrap, you have to set the mousetrap, right? You have to put energy in to pull the mousetrap back. But once it's set, it doesn't take any more energy from you. It just takes, this is kind of morbid, I guess. It just takes the mouse to crawl up onto it, and then it snaps. But the energy is already there. You already give it the energy whenever you cock back the bar or the myosin head here. It has the energy. Now it's just ready to release it. Same thing here with this. The ATP is what's going to be used to, one, break the cross bridge, and then, two, to reset or pull back to the high energy state the myosin head. And I think a mousetrap is a good metaphor for it because this is where the energy from the ATP is consumed, not the power stroke, which is where you would think, like, Oh, we use the energy. We really use the energy to reset the myosin head. So a little bit later, it can do the power stroke. So we've reset. One of two things can happen here. If there's calcium still present, it's just going to keep doing this over and over and over again, repeating steps two, three, and four. That myosin head is going to grab onto the actin. It's going to pull, and then it will release and reset in the presence of ATP. Grab, pull, release, and reset. 
grab, pull, release, and reset. Unless there's no more calcium, then we're done. As long as there's calcium present. In other words, as long as the brain keeps sending signals to the SR to keep releasing its calcium, this muscle cell is going to keep contracting and contracting and contracting as long as it can. This would be like sustaining a muscle contraction over a long period of time and you're not like letting go. But we don't want all of our muscles to stay contracted all of the time, that would be really bad. So we have to be able to relax muscles as well. And what happens there? Well, calcium is just gonna get re-pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum so that it can't interact with this process anymore. And that's gonna turn off the muscle cell. Because remember, if there's no calcium present, the tropomyosin will block off the binding sites and the muscle can't contract anymore. The muscle then will relax and it'll be ready to contract again whenever we have more calcium released from the SR. But until then, we're back to our relaxed state. Ah. So to recap all of that, we've got our myosin and our actin filaments. In the presence of calcium, that's gonna turn this on. Basically the SR releases the calcium, it bonds with the troponin. The troponin pulls back the tropomyosin revealing the binding sites. The myosin heads are gonna grab on to the binding sites. We call that forming a cross bridge. They're gonna pull on the actin molecule. We call that the power stroke. And then the myosin head in the presence of ATP is gonna release and reset back to its excited state. That process of grabbing, pulling, releasing, resetting, grabbing, pulling, releasing, resetting, that's gonna keep happening as long as there is calcium present from the SR. Whenever we're ready to relax the muscle, the SR is gonna pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and once that calcium is gone, then the tropomyosin covers up the binding sites and we're back to our relaxed state. And of course, this whole process, like I said, has to start with an action potential, synaptic transmission, conduction down the sarcolemma into the T-tubule, causing the SR to release calcium, and then it goes through all of that stuff that we just did to have a nice contracted muscle. Now, if you want to test your understanding, take a moment and pause the video, describe what happens in each of the five steps of the sliding filament model without any of the text on here as a guide. If you can explain what happens in each of those five steps, then you have a pretty good understanding of the sliding filament model of muscle contraction. Now, here's that text back again if you want to check and see how you did. All right, can you find the A in filament? Where's the A? Can you point to the A? Yeah, good job. Good job. Yeah, what's over there? Can you point? Can you find? Can you find an M? Can you find an M? Good job. Have we even learned that one yet? How do you know where an M is?